Harford County has been actively working to combat the opioid epidemic along with substance abuse and mental health issues in our community. Recovery is possible. There is hope and there is help. Join us in the next 30 minutes as we speak to members of our community that have proven just that. I'm Christy Breslin and this is Harford Magazine. I'm here with Danny McGee. He is the author of Chasing a Flawed Son, a very brave young man who has really been through the ringer as far as addiction goes. He's here to share his story about what he went through, how he recovered, and to give all of those people out there that are experiencing substance abuse hope and show them there is life after addiction. Hi, Danny. Hello, how you doing? Danny, I know that you have had a very long history with addiction. How did it begin? When did it begin? I'd say it began with fear and insecurity as a child. I was a very frail, sensitive, late blooming child who was much smaller than every, all my peers and I overcompensated. I overcompensated by trying to be a tough guy, by selling drugs, by being bad and breaking all the rules. And I found that um, at a very early age that alcohol helped me do those things. Alcohol helped me be this persona that I thought I had to be in order to cover up that insecure, shy, skinny little kid. Alcohol gave me courage to do all these things that I thought that I wanted to do to be this pretend person that I thought I wanted to be. And because it made me the person that I wanted to be, I started to drink it every day and every night until eventually I was fully addicted at a very early age. What made you want to make this change? What made you want to get clean? The alcohol led me on a deadly spiral of violence and drunk driving and crime and all kinds of stuff, but the heroin actually broke me down. When I started using heroin when I was 17, it took my entire ego and threw it out the window. Instantly, I didn't want to be an addict. Instantly, when I realized that I no longer had control of my thoughts, of my life, of anything, and that I was controlled by a substance, I wanted to be away from it. Um, the term rock bottom is thrown around a lot, but rock bottom to me, is infinite. I know that if I go out and get high again tomorrow or the next day that I'll do things that I never thought I would do before because I've done most of my nevers already. And so if, th if I think things were as bad as they could get, they can always get worse. So when I say that, I say most addicts don't want to be addicts. It's a cycle of misery and pain that we do not want to be in. Unfortunately, the drug has control of our thoughts and our mind and our emotion, and we live in a circle of fear that's very hard to climb out of. Danny, how did you finally recover? I want to say it was a process. It was a process of being beat up time and time and time again by making mistakes, going back to jail, going to rehab, losing everything that I had um, that finally just beat me up so bad that I surrendered, and I was willing to do whatever it took. And it was also a part maturity. I, I began to mature and um, my thought process changed and I no longer looked at myself as a victim of circumstances. I looked at myself as a victim of my own behavior. And I started taking personal responsibility for everything that happened to me. And those three things combined gave me the strength to start to do the right thing and to live life the right way and take advice from people who had done what I've done and live a life in recovery. Now you wrote a book. It's open, it's honest, it's inspiring, called Chasing a Flawed Son. Tell us about that. There's a lot of stories about recovery out there, but I don't think that many of them go into the actual mind and thoughts of an addict. And that's what I wanted to share with people who have loved ones or who have lost loved ones to drugs. I wanted them to see why, why we tick, what makes us do the things we do, and how we feel when we're actively using, because I don't think a lot of people understand that. What are you doing to help others? I have almost a sense of guilt for being alive because I don't feel like I deserve to be here. Um, and so that prompts me to give back, to give back to the community that I stole from, that I ravaged when I was a teenager. Um, and out of that, 
I started buying toys for children at Christmas time who have parents who are addicts, who have either died from addiction or incarcerated, because I don't want the children to repeat that cycle. So I took 50 children every year with my own money shopping for Christmas, but other members of the community saw what I was doing and jumped on board and started donating to sponsored children. That quickly grew to 250 children. Once I saw the impact that I could make, I started doing homeless feedings downtown. I started leading mission trips to other countries. I started doing disaster relief. I started uh, helping people in addiction, and it just grew into this movement that is what it is today. And so um, that gives me purpose, and that gives me life, and that fuels my sobriety. You're fully recovered. You're living a very fulfilling life, and I understand you just got married. Thank you. Yeah, it's amazing. We just got married three months ago in um, Riviera Maya, Mexico. And I actually met her because her brother was an addict at the time. And um, unfortunately, he passed. And so um, me and her went to a, a heroin event in Havity Grace, and I was a speaker there, and so was Pastor Craig. And um, we met Pastor Craig and heard him speak for the first time, and she fell in love with his message because he too lost his daughter to addiction. And we've been going to his church ever since. For anyone out there that needs somebody to talk to, needs somebody to reach out to and get more information about this drug epidemic and what can be done to end it, how can they get in contact with you? Well, I've got a website. It's chasingaflawedson.com, and son is S-U-N. And um, my Facebook page, Daniel McGee, I, I post a lot of my activities, nonprofit work and stuff on there. And if anybody wants to reach out to me regarding treatment or seeking help, they can call my cell phone directly, and that's 410-652-6003. Danny, thank you so much. Thank you for what you do, and thank you for being such a strong and hopeful voice here in Harford County. You're welcome. Thank you. Now, coming up next, we're going to speak to a local criminal attorney who works with people who are battling substance abuse and how she gets them back on their feet. Stay with us. Adele Brockmeyer is a local attorney who has worked with Danny for years. She's going to talk about her experience working with Danny and how she is helping others through the criminal process. Hi, Adele. Hi, thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. Adele, how did you and Danny first meet? And what made you take an interest in his story? I was a public defender at the time in Harford County, and I went to see him at the detention center. We just get assigned whatever clients come in the door. And when I went to meet him, he was this frail little, looked like a young boy, even though he was about 19, 20 years old. He only weighed about 115 pounds, was going through withdrawal, but even in the state he was in physically and mentally, you could see that there was a like a burning ember in him that wanted to get clean. He had this strong desire. He needed the game plan. He had this will that he thought there was something else out there. I could see that in him. I'm not sure if at the time he could, but I still saw a very polite, conversational, enjoyable person inside of this shell that I was that was sitting in front of me and because of that I took an interest in him and felt that if I presented him with a game plan that he would go through with it. What kind of growth have you seen from him in the past almost two decades? I knew that even though the first time with Danny we sent him off to treatment and after a couple of months he got high again. And then we came up with a second game plan, and then we came up with a third game plan, and then it finally stuck. But you have to be accepting and willing to keep going because once you stop trying, as long as your client still has the desire, you need to still keep pushing forward with him and never give up. Well, Adele, we know he didn't give up. He never gave up. Where is he today? The same person I sat and talked to 20 years ago almost is still sitting in front of me today. It's just that he is a clean and sober person. He still has the same charismatic, magnetic personality. He's just, and his desire is still there, but now his desire is to help others because he has helped himself. Tell me about your experience being a criminal attorney and what kind of personal effect does it have on you? We are very active and involved with the courts, with judges. Um, my husband, who's my partner, is very in law 
is very active working with veterans. And so through all of the really bad cases, we've learned about the traumatic effects of mental health and how all of these, the traumas, mental health issues, are most of the time an underlying issue in substance abuse. And that we as society need to be more accepting of those. And if we can be accepting and say, this person has anxiety, this person suffered a trauma as a child, that we can get past those issues, the substance abuse problems are a lot of times are a secondary issue. And so through all these years of the really bad cases, we've learned to be able to help the next person and to present this to judges. And we've done lots of research and we read about it and we go to lectures about this exact subject and how we can help the future generations and future people that walk into our office and say to them, do you have some type of underlying mental health issue and don't be embarrassed to say it. It's a chemical imbalance or it's something that happened to you in your life and that's why you have a substance abuse problem. Instead of just saying you're a bad person because you use drugs and you must just use drugs because you're a bad person, which is what they hear and they internalize so much, that through all the negatives and the worst cases, we've learned and been able to help others. If somebody has a question or they need help legally or they have someone that needs help legally, they need some advice, how can they reach out to you? We answer lots of phone calls, you know, no one is ever obligated. If you just want to reach out and find out what would be a good treatment center, because every treatment center is different depending on your issue, what, if there's a mental health issue behind it, what kind of substance abuse, what kind of belief systems you have, and we're always willing to just sit and have a phone call with someone. You can reach out to us directly. The best way is through our Facebook page, and then you can send us a message, and we usually respond within an hour or two to that. And what is your Facebook page? Turnbull Brockmeyer Law Group. Adele, thank you so much. You're helping so many people in our community, and we're so grateful. Thank you for having me. Well, coming up next, we're going to speak to a young woman who's going to share her story of how she got into drugs, how she has now recovered, and what she's doing helping others at a local treatment center. Stay with us. Stephanie Rice is the Admissions Director for Hope's Horizon, and she's here to tell us about her personal experience with drugs, how she got in recovery, and what she's doing now to give back to the community. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, how are you? Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Stephanie, tell me about your background, and when did you become clean? How did you finally do it? So I've been clean for two years now. I started using in high school, um, like someone introduced me to it and it was the thing that made me cool. I know a lot of people say that, but um, you know, that was where I fit in. That's like how I had a good time and that's how people liked me. Um, so that's really how I got into doing drugs. And then I was in um, a really bad relationship, um, a lot of domestic violence um, and things of that nature. And that's when I got into opiates. And that's really when my life made like a turn, like a really bad turn. And um, that's how I wound up in treatment eventually. It took me eight years to finally get to my rock bottom. You know what I mean? Like it took me, a, it was a long journey and it was exhausting. But I got here now and now I work in recovery and I get to give back, which is an amazing thing. What made you want to become sober? What was the actual tipping point? I have two kids. Um, I have an eight-year-old. Well, now he's 10, actually. I'm so used to saying he's eight. He's 10, and then I have a five-year-old. Um, I ruin birthdays, I ruin holidays, and I ruin vacations. I miss out on memories, and I finally got sick of it one day. I was just done. I just, I mean, literally my whole mindset changed, and I was just absolutely done is the best way I can explain it. Stephanie, you have completely turned your life around, and now you're giving back to the community. How are you doing that? So I work at Hope's Horizon Treatment Center. Um, I'm the intake coordinator, so I'm the first face you see when you walk into Hope's Horizon. And I deal with the clients um, on a day-to-day -day basis. I help them get into treatment. I work with their families, their friends, their loved ones. You know, I kind of look at it as if, um, 
they were my child and I'm their mother. I would want someone to treat my kid and help my kid the way I've been able to help people. And it's been a blessing that Hope's Horizon gave me this opportunity. And it's like I said, it's been a long journey to get to where I'm at, but it's amazing. What seems to be the drug or drugs that are causing the biggest problem in our community? It's fentanyl, 100% fentanyl. Um, people come in thinking there's gonna be multiple drugs in their system because they think they're doing, for instance, like Xanax or Percocet, and they wound up taking um, a urinalysis and only fentanyl's in their system. And I see this happen over and over again every day. Fentanyl is taking over the community, and what's happening is they're pressing pills and they're making them look like other drugs. Um, and it's just pure fentanyl. I mean, nothing else is in their system. What exactly is fentanyl? I don't know how to explain it. There's like about four different types of fentanyl, and it's deadly. It's like a tranquilizer. It's a mixture of some horrible concoction, I guess you can say, and, you know, that's where these overdoses are coming from. That's why it's spiked so much. How does working within the recovery community actually keep you focused on your own recovery? It's, it's hard to focus on my own recovery, like, to be honest with you, um, because I'm so focused on everyone else. But you have to, like, give it away to keep it, basically. And, you know, working with addicts and them coming in at their rock bottom, I have to keep on, like, the forefront of my brain or my mind and remind myself I never want to go back there. Like, I have such a good relationship with my family and my children, and it just, when I see people come in, it just really, truly hits my heart, and I just, I don't know, I just don't want to go back to that. Well, you are doing great, and you're working at Hope's Horizon. What exactly is Hope's Horizon? We are a 21 to 28 day um, partial hospitalization program. We also offer IOP, which is outpatient and traditional outpatient. Um, it's you stay at a housing component and then we transport you to and from the center each day and you do groups from nine to three o'clock. For someone that's struggling and they really wanna get clean, they wanna get into recovery, how can we reach out to you and get more information? So you can reach out and call me directly. My phone number is 240-808-9441. I know all the ins and outs of um, Hope's Horizon and the bed availability, and I can try to get you in right away. Stephanie, thank you so much. Sharing your story was so brave, and we are so grateful to have people like you that are working so hard to end this epidemic and to save lives. Thank you so much. Michael Towers is the CEO of Speaking of Your Success. He is here with us today to tell us his personal story battling drug addiction and how he got clean, also what he's doing to help others. Hi, Michael. Hi, Kirsty. Well, Michael, it sounds like you've made quite a few life changes yourself. Let's take a step back and let's talk about your experience with substance abuse. Yeah, so I took my first drink in 1995 at Senior Week. Uh, we went to Ocean City, Maryland. Uh, started drinking. I know that I was partying pretty hard and uh, we started on a Sunday and by Thursday I'd gotten so ill. Uh, I had laryngitis and pneumonia. Uh, my friends were all Boy Scouts. They were Eagle Scouts, the highest scouting honor you can get. And they were like, Mike, you know, you're pretty ill. You should go to a walk-in clinic and see a doctor. And, you know, a walk-in clinic costs like $65. And $65 at that time was about $20 worth of marijuana and about three packs of a Red Dog beer. So I said, you know what, I know I'm sick. I'm not gonna spend weed and beer money on, on a doctor. And I just kept partying. And when I went into college that next semester, alcohol was more important than school. It was more important than relationships. Alcohol was more important than anything. Was there any particular moment that made you realize, I have to change, I have to get better? Every day in 1998 was a day where I said, I don't want to do this anymore. I would wake up on a couch, uh, hung over. I wasn't in my 8 a.m. class. And I would say, I, I can't do this. I'm not doing this anymore. And, and that night, I'd be at Gators uh, on my way to another blackout. And it was like, it was this vicious cycle. And I would pass out. And... One night I got on my knees and I said, you know what, God, please help me. 
And uh, that next morning I woke up and I, I felt this peace, a peace I had, I had never experienced before, um, a peace really honestly I haven't experienced since. Um, and I knew without a shadow of a doubt that I would never drink or use drugs again for the rest of my life. And uh, November 13th of 1998 was my sobriety date. That is an incredible story. How are you giving back now? And what are you doing to help others that are pretty much in the same situation that you once were? So as a counselor and, and deciding to go back to school and getting a degree in counseling and psychology, I've been able to actually do that for a career. But in my opinion, if it's a career, it's not that true altruistic you know, effort to help other people. So at church, for instance, uh, I always get an email from somebody at church saying, hey, somebody put in a prayer request and they're struggling with X, Y, and Z, where it's pornography, whether it's drugs, whether it's alcohol, can you reach out to them? And so I do that. On social media, I'm very open about my struggles with mental health uh, and addiction, and uh, that I've been sober for 21 years, and that I have bipolar, and I've had success treating my bipolar for the last 20 years. So people reach out to me on Facebook all the time with messages, so I help them out. So those are the ways that I help people out. Here's the deal, don't drink today. Don't use drugs today. I absolutely 100% give you permission to drink tomorrow. Use drugs tomorrow, just don't do it today. Uh, plan your day, you know, stay busy. Uh, account for every minute of the day. Do not get bored and surround yourself with the right people. Surround yourself with people that are like-minded, that, that have goals of recovery, uh, that are good influences. And if you can do those three things, you can, you can get sober. Michael, thank you so much for being here and thank you for sharing your story with us. Gladly. Now coming up next, we're going to speak to a well-known pastor in our community and his wife who lost their daughter, Hannah, to a heroin addiction at a very young age. They have become voices in our community on ending this epidemic through education and religion. Stay tuned. Joining me now is Pastor Craig and Lisa McLaughlin from Mount Zion Church. They say that there is no pain greater than losing a child. These two have lost their precious daughter, Hannah, at a very young age to a heroin addiction. They're here to tell us about that unimaginable experience and what they're doing here at Mount Zion to help end this epidemic in Harford County. Hi, Pastor Craig. Hi, Lisa. It's good to be here. It's good to see you. Lisa, how did you feel watching Hannah struggling with addiction? Oh my, I felt fear, anger, um, I felt betrayed, I felt confused, everything. We did not see this coming in her and so we were blindsided when we realized that's the road she was going down. It was a very fearful thing to just be afraid of where this was going to take her. Um, I knew very little about addiction, and so I had a lot to learn. There was confusion on um, how did this happen when we had known nothing, expected nothing in our family. There was anger when we realized that um, as a young child she had been betrayed and traumatized and that took her down this road. There was just a myriad of emotions that all came. But the biggest one was fear because every time we thought that um, we understood what would help her best and would help her in another program, support her, encourage her, then things would very quickly go downhill again and again. You have a very big family, so I imagine this had a major impact on all of you. How did it affect everyone? It was very difficult and affected each of us strongly, but perhaps in little different ways depending on personality and their relationship with Hannah. Uh, her siblings were very frightened. They were hurt. They were scared, mostly, but very, very supportive of her, trying to help constantly what would be best for her. 
we would take family vacations which wrapped around wherever Hannah was. She was at a rehab long term over a year in Utah and our family vacation was going out there and spending time with Hannah. And so it was very much a family struggle and support network. Pastor Craig, what would you say to other parents who have a child that is struggling with addiction? Well, the first thing I would say is to learn about addiction. Um, addiction is such an overwhelmingly powerful thing that gets hold of people. And a super quick little thing on addiction is that addiction gets hold of a back part of the brain, which is the survival place in the brain. Up in the front is where you do all your emotional and rational thinking, but back here is where you do your survival decisions. Um, you keep eating, you keep, you keep drinking water, you keep all the things to survive, and that's where addiction gets hold, and, and for a long number of reasons. But what this means is, it, and it's stronger than this part of the brain. So as a parent, you're watching your child make one irrational decision after another. And because this is telling them you will not survive without that drug. And so you watch your, your child just making insane decisions. So I think education is the first thing. Um, if a child is young, I tell parents, if they're a, a minor, and maybe you see them just getting into drugs, do everything you possibly can to get between your child and those drugs. Because once, if, if I'll say, if addiction takes hold, it's so overwhelmingly powerful that your, quote, chances of success of getting that child sober just plummet. So early on, do everything you possibly can. Lisa, what would you like to say to parents who have actually lost a child to an overdose? If parents know that they're not alone, they can reach out. There are support groups. There are others of us walking that same horrible road and we can help lift one another up and help one another along the journey. Craig, Mount Zion is doing so much to address this epidemic in Harford County. What steps are you taking to do that? You know, something I've, I've learned is that church and government and various organizations can work together. And so we've tried really hard to work with, for example, the Office of Drug Control Policy here in Harford County and, and various organizations, hosting seminars, hosting events, hosting the Narcan training. Um, so working in partnership, we've, we've brought in, in partnership with the county government speakers. We've had 500 people listen to speakers here. Um, we host a, a play that the, the government puts on every year, county government um, addicted and it's powerful. And then we, we have some groups here. We have a Celebrate Recovery Group, which is a faith-based recovery group, um, excellent organization. My wife and I lead a couple groups. Uh, one is called Loving an Addict, so it's a support group for people who have a loved one in addiction and that we can learn from each other. Uh, we also uh, lead a group called GRASP, which is a grief support group for those who have lost someone to addiction. So there's a lot that can be done. What words of encouragement can you offer to people that have lost hope? And I'm talking about addicts and their families as well. To beat it, you need to go at it, what I say, 1,000%. You can't go at it 50%, 75%. Your, your statistical odds of beating this, of coming through this alive, are so small. So I would say, go at it a thousand percent. Whatever it takes, do it. Go at it. There are resources, there is help, there are programs. Don't do the least like, or the least thing that you could do. Do the biggest, most radical thing you could do. Are the services that you offer at Mount Zion free of charge? And if so, how do we find out more about them? Sure, everything's, everything's free of charge. Um, we have a website, um, mzpraise, P-R-A-Y-S, dot org. Um, you can call the, the church here. It's 410-836-7444, and we'll get you plugged in to everything that's going on. Okay, Pastor Craig and Lisa, thank you so much, and thank you for your words of hope, and thank you for your words of encouragement. Great. Thank, thank you, you. Christy. Thank you. 
As you have seen today, recovery is possible. There is hope and there is help. We've lost so many lives to the drug epidemic in the county and around the world. But working together through education and support, we can make it all come to an end. Start the conversation. Save a life. I'm Christy Breslin. See you next month on Harford Magazine. Thank you.